today my research is pretty much centered around the untold mysteries, the untold histories. If there's a mystery somewhere on this continent, I'm probably up to my eyeballs in it. I'm not so much a treasure hunter, and that's okay if you don't believe me. <laughs> I didn't come here today to convince you or prove to you that my research is accurate, true, and correct. That's something you have to do for yourself. I started this research diving into this 30 some odd years ago, and I did it for me. And my reasons for doing this is I just plain simply had to know the truth. So we've got some things here, but we have all been schooled on the expeditions of the Europeans coming to the Americas. We have all heard that Columbus was the first Europe European to discover the Americas. We've also been told here in Utah that Escalante was the first European to have traveled this place here in Utah. Some of us know better. I think the majority here, that they're just, there's too much evidence that surfaced over the year that shows this is likely not the case. Although there are many things that causes one to raise his eyebrows, one of the many discoveries that I personally proved to myself is authentic is the discovery and the authenticity of the Tucson lead crosses. Some of you have probably heard of them. Some of them, I'm sure, have never heard of them. The Tucson Lead Crosses are a group of some 30 artifacts that were unearthed in Caliche, a Caliche deposit in Tucson, Arizona, 1924. Had not the private sector been deeply involved in this discovery, I doubt that you would have ever heard of them. What does it have to do with Northeastern Utah? Written upon these artifacts was found the story of Roman colonies having arrived here at a time of the known rise of the Western Roman Empire, 1775, or excuse me, 775. The text also speaks, speaks of previous visits to the America as early as 100 BC, with the people disappearing and returning to their country of origin at the fall of the Western Roman Empire. It leaves one thinking, what exactly is the Western Roman Empire? It took me many years to prove, however, from the beginning, I felt this discovery was authentic. If you're not familiar with this discovery of the Tucson Lead Crosses, feel free to search it out on Google. Be warned, the academics don't want you to know about it or to believe it. You make that decision. I have often wondered why there are certain things discovered and some put forth such a great effort to discredit, diffuse, and keep you from knowing. And yet some of the most seeming ridiculous things they seem to ignore and encourage. I'll bet many of you have wondered why. Why do they care? What difference does it make who discovered America? I personally don't think it really has anything to do with who discovers America. I think it has everything to do with the unknown history of this, this place we live, here in the West, this continent. There is another aspect of history that it would appear an all-out effort has been implemented in an effort to hide the truth from you. <coughs> and it is part of our history. 
And it's much more personal. It's your lineage, your history. Where did you come from? Who are you? I think some of you would be pretty surprised to find out exactly who you descend from. Many of you have heard of the Knights Templars, and we've heard all the academic views about who they are. A bunch of guys who became powerful, rich, ran around the world trying to hide a little wooden cup. And about none of it's true. Just to conclude this part, I'll say that the Knights Templars had a very specific purpose and a righteous one at that, and they were very good at it. And it wasn't traveling around the world trying to hide a massive accumulated treasure. And they certainly weren't trying to hide a little wooden cup from the rest of the world. What does this have to do with Northeastern Utah? Their objective was very different in coming to this land compared to all others whose prime motive was greed. Many here tonight thought that I came here to talk about Spanish treasure stories. My interests lie much deeper than Spanish treasure or even the Spanish occupation. My interests are in why. Were the cartographers of the day just guessing? Now please understand this map that you're looking at. Assuming Rick got it right. This map is from 1575, just 62 years after the first explorer, Juan Ponce de Leon, underwent his land expedition from Florida to the west, with Coronado not far behind him in about 1540, from Mexico City to today's New Mexico of today. How did they manage to accomplish so much in such a short time? Where are all the exploration documents to accommodate all the notations on this map? I have a collection of 180 recognized exploration documents translated into English from the late 1800s. Where's the history of all these places you see on this map? I haven't read all of them, but I've read a lot of them. And there's no way they did all that in that short period of time. On this 1652 map, notice California is recorded as an island. Why? The academics claim it was a mistake. But what they don't tell you is that prior to the cataclysmic event about 2,000 years ago, much of California was indeed an island. But how did these Spanish cartographers know this? Notice the Gulf of California as it extends all the way to modern day Las Vegas. What happened? It just might have been an event that you might have heard of, but it didn't happen 250 million years ago, over a period of a million years or so. It likely happened a mere 1,100 years ago, and in one day, the Colorado Plateau uplift, the event of which is documented by several different cultures. Of the many cultures that have come here in the past includes people known today as Alte Mongolians, Hebrew, Chinese, the Indians of India, Indo-Greeks, Welsh, Scots, Portuguese, and Romans, not just the Spanish, but of those in AD times, why do they all seem to be looking for the same place. 
By the way, I did leave out the French. A certain place that appears on several maps, a place called Septimania, with a lake named Kapala, surrounded by seven cities in a land called Calalus or Calicus. Why? What is so important about this place on the south flank of the Uinta Mountains? There are some who have, who have a hard time believing that man has been building boats and coming to this continent for near 5,000 years. I'm of the opinion that man has been building boats ever since that guy Noah built one. Just a few facts you can feel free to consider but certainly don't take my word for it. Originally, this get-together was to be at Moon Lake. So the distances I am about to give are based upon being at Moon Lake by the lodge. Okay, so... Within 40 miles of where we sit, of course, that would... Vietnam Lake is over a hundred mine locations, at least 13 cash sites, and several other things, and I'm certain even more. Approximately 800 yards from here is an old Spanish mine which was blasted shut sometime after the Moon Lake Dam reconstruction project in 1938. Some of you got to see that the other day. <coughs> 1,600 yards from here is where the famous Don Foot writings were found, which no longer exist, believed to have been intentionally destroyed. Roughly 650 yards from here is located one of the most famous mines in the Uintas, known as the Sacred Mine of the Utes, also known as the Church Mine, and some call it the Rhodes Mine. About 1.8 miles from here is one of the larger mining projects of the past, but certainly is not the largest in the Uintas. And it is the primary reason the trail running up the west side of Moon Lake exists today. Some would have you believe the Forest Service created that trail. However, it has been here for a very long time. The mine workings extend another mile and a half up the canyon and have been worked as far back as 1200 A.D. Another is about a mile and a tenth from where we would be sitting and could have been seen from that very spot. That's about two miles in length. About five miles from that point is buried some of the most respected Shoshone chiefs previously thought to be Ute. And it is one of the few reasons why the Ute tribe to this day would rather you not be there. Thirteen miles from that place, as a crow flies, is the largest tunnel shaft mining operation of the past. The mine dump covers three and a half acres. It's an average of 70 feet thick. It is believed that the main tunnel travels all the way through the mountain and exits approximately one mile away, its mouth on the other side of the mountain. This mine is one of the most sought after mines due to its almost unknown history. But of all the mines, it's the most lacking in information in order to find it. And it remains hidden, largely because its large size is bigger than most people's imaginations. The mine is known of the, as the Mina del Rey, or the Mine of the King, 
not the king's mind, as some have written in the past. It is believed to have been mined as far back as the days of King Hiram, the friend of King Solomon in 900 BC. And although it is certainly possible, I have my reservations. It is believed to be the prime location to where the contents of Mel Fisher's sunken ship, the Atosha, truly came from, including the emeralds. Another five miles beyond this mine is one of the strangest anomalies I have ever seen in the Uintas. An unconfirmed mine dump that if in fact it is what it seems to be would be the largest open pit or open face mine in the Uintas. It's mine dump covering 160 acres averaging a thickness of 100 to 150 feet. I could be wrong. Aside from today's Rio Tinto operations at Kennecott, this would be the largest mine, man-made mine, at least in Utah. And I assure you, it's not a natural slide. And it wasn't made by Spaniards. And just a mile or so, from the previous anomaly is located more of the largest and oldest mining operations in the UNS. Just 15 miles from that spot, or four miles from where we are now, is one of the places where beginning in 1926, Kaiser Wilhelm, the last emperor of Prussia, was buying up hundreds, if not thousands, of acres at the hand of Baron von Horst. And then in 1943, after Kaiser Wilhelm and the Baron had passed, someone began selling it off. Why? About six and a half miles from there, Moon Lake, was once a very large foundry one in which was built so long ago that it was near non-existent or profoundly in ruin when the Spanish arrived in the 1500s. I won't say how far from here, but not far, are believed to be found two cities of ancient origin. One is believed to be one of the seven on the old maps showing Lake Kapala. The other is noted on this map north of the lake. Approximately 21 and 27 miles from that place at Moon Lake are located two Roman vaults rediscovered by Antonio de Spejo sometime during his last and fatal expedition between 1584 and 1588. Orthodox history has him dying in Havana in 1585. If this was true, then how did he sign his map dated 1588? I assume you're on board back there, right? <laughs> and not to just a few miles from that particular place is the single most important location in the Uintas of which I will leave it to you and your imaginations let's just say it's not in White Rocks, and it isn't in Rock Creek. Thomas Rhodes was quoted as to saying that there is a certain formation in which geologists would not consider. And if you can find out this formation, you can follow it through the Uintas from mine to mine to mine. And certainly don't take my word for it. 
But this statement, I assure you, is true. Now, I would like to leave you with something to ponder, and this is applicable to the very most important thing about this place. We've all heard, well, I wouldn't say we all have. <clears throat> we have heard from the writings of Plato, a place called Atlantis. T-I-S is a suffix, giving ownership, in that you or something are from Atlan. We know the legendary King Arthur, about 500 AD, frequented some distant land called Avalon, or as the academics have come to spell it, Avalon or Avalon. However, the Welsh have no Z or B in their alphabet, even to this day. King Arthur requested to be buried at this island of Avalon. Something to think about. We know that his great and some odd grandsons, about 250 years, 550, and 750 years later, followed in his footsteps. One of them you may be familiar with, known as Prince Madoc. He was the son of the King of Wales, Owen of Gwynedd. Madoc was simply following a very old trail. We know the Aztecs left a place in humility, a place they called Ozotlan, which was a place of seven cities surrounding a lake. Why they left can be a long story. It has also been referred to as Turtle Island by other tribes. It wasn't called Turtle Island because it looked like a turtle. It was once a prime breeding ground for the very large sea turtle. Those of you who live here in the basin can attest to the many sea turtle shells in the area. But the one place of the past that learning of that knocked my socks off while studying many original texts of the Bible and a majority seem to agree with each other. It would seem that in the book of Genesis, speaking of the Garden of Eden, it is said, implied, or inferred that there was a large source of water that naturally breached the surface of the earth and formed four heads. This is an unusual occurrence, people. But nonetheless, it happened. And as far as I have been able to discover, it has only happened at one applicable place on this planet, and that's the Uinta Mountains. Some might consider a lonely word in an often disregarded book, the word Ripleyancum, said to mean to exceed all, of which it most certainly did. Moving on with that text, there is described four rivers. The first being the river Pisan. It is said that this river in them days traveled around a land of gold, delium, and onyx stone. Plato wrote of Atlantis, King Arthur visited and was buried in a place called Ophelon. The Aztec came from a land called Aslan. The land that this river of the Garden of Eden, which compasseth or traveled through or around, was called Havala. Is it possible? Are we beginning to see why so many cultures of the past are seeking this same place? There's one hell of a story to be told, people, and I don't know that I'm the one that's up to doing it. Tonight, you've only experienced a very small glimpse of the untold history of not only this place here in eastern 
Utah, northeastern, but this continent. Thank you.